Welcome to the Prompt Engineering Podcast, where we teach you the art of writing effective prompts for AI systems like ChatGPT, Midjourney, Dolly, and more. Each week, we explore prompting techniques, interviews with experts and newbies, and tips on selling your prompts. Here's your host, Greg Schwartz. Welcome to the Prompt Engineering Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Schwartz. So we have a guest with us today. Go ahead and introduce yourself. You'll notice Bruno is like the very technical one and I'm very much the touchy feely one with prompt engineering and it's two different uh, approaches, but I'll try my best to describe it and Bruno can then explain what the heck I'm trying to say essentially. <laughs> yeah. I feel like sure. sometimes there is this prompt design like part. Mm -hmm. There's also this application part and sometimes just the application is just more interesting than the prompting techniques. So I have two awesome individuals from Quest GPT. And I met them at ETH Denver, which was this very fun and exciting conference and hackathon and great experience, except for the fact that the Wi-Fi basically never worked. So it was hard to build anything at the event, which was a very weird experience for a hackathon. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we don't need to talk about that. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. I'm Adam Boyle. Nice to meet everyone. Nice to meet you, Greg. I met Bruno at ETH Denver at the hackathon. I have a background in solution engineering. I'm essentially a demo guy. I'm a highly paid Vanna White. I say, click this button, do this button, you know, selling sort of AI machine learning software for a long time. And this chat GPT stuff has just kind of the game across the board and just building cool stuff now with Bruno. Nice to meet you all. I am Bruno. I have a background in neuroscience and I've been doing software development for quite some time now. I CTO at the community one. We develop uh, products for community management. I'm working with Adam now. It's nice to be here. Awesome. So Adam and Bruno, how did you first learn about chat GPT and prompt engineering? Must have heard it through the internet, just going nuts. I was definitely late to it overall, just slowly, but surely my YouTube started to get full with how to create side hustles with chat GPT. Cause I'm a little bit of a side hustler myself. I had a uh, best man speech I had to write. So I had a wedding coming up and I was like, oh, maybe this is, this could be useful. And that was sort of first full foray into chat GPT. I was trying to write a speech and uh, it took a while and I really test the limits, but that's how I got familiar with it. And that's when I really started to learn what it was all about. Oh, that's awesome. That is the first speech, particularly best man speech, but even just speech that I've heard of being written with chat GPT. So I have to ask then, how did it go? It went really well. It was, at first it was for fun. It was like, okay, write me a best man speech. And I was blown away by actual, just how good of a decent speech it was. But then I was curious what this thing was capable of. So I was, I told ChatGPT, make it a little, make it subtly obvious that I'm in love with the bride. And then ChatGPT <laughs> was like, started to show some jealousy. And I'm like, make it more obvious, make it a little bit more angry. And slowly but surely you learn how to interact with chat GPT. And it was like, you don't deserve her. Really? You don't, I do. You know, and I really pushed the boundaries and I was like, write it in Trump's voice. So Trump's giving the speech. Oh, wow. Uh, then I was, I wanted to break it. I was like, write it as if you were a Tyrannosaurus Rex and you're hungry. And it was still bringing in jokes where it's I'm hungry and I bite when I'm hungry. Just kidding. Ha. Huh? So that's really where I saw how far you could stretch this thing. And then I used it to even write a couple jokes that went really well. I was pretty surprised. Uh, the one particular joke, it, I have to give ChatGPT the credit for it, but it said, Mike, I'm not going to say that you're the best guy ever, but every day, are you trying to become a better person than you were the day before? Like, also, no, you're not all, you know, also, no. And it was pretty good. It, uh, it really helped. It really did. Uh, I use ChatGPT. I use some other things online. And then I did honestly write a little bit of myself, but it was useful. I've been using it ever since. That's amazing. Wow. Bruno, how about you? Yeah, it's such a cool story. I don't have a <laughs> cool okay. story for this. I uh, basically <laughs> been, using, been using it for like summarizing papers and like, trying to do a lot of things uh, much less time. Be cool. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. definitely going to be a hard story to beat. I don't think I've heard one that good before. So well done, Adam. <laughs> I was just lazy. It was yeah. a meaningful moment in my life and I didn't want to do it myself. So technology, AI. So we're building a game master 
storyteller that can uh, develop an interesting, engaging and fun story for people to play with. A lot of people want to get like into games like uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Especially with the movie that just came out. Yeah, and uh, but there's so much prep to do and sometimes people just don't want to do it. And uh, if you're not in interested in being the storyteller, then it's hard to find a storyteller. So we're trying to like fill this void, especially for people who want to like solo role play. That's also like a, a very untapped market. Also like for multiplayer experiences. Uh, so that's what the uh, Quest GPT is. One of the pitfalls that can uh, we sometimes encounter when building like these conversations these stories, like it's kind of loop thing where we also take the, what the player has said in the past as, uh, as part of our prompt is that the AI may learn patterns that you don't want it to learn during the conversations. So you have to take steps to mitigate that happening. Like look for patterns that you do not want or like constrain it so that it will only keep the ones that you really want. What's an example of a, a pattern that you wouldn't want, either in Quest GPT or, or something else? For example, once we had, a, we had a hard time debugging this because we thought this was a bug. But uh, basically, the way we were designing this prompt, sometimes the, the DM thought it was talking to itself. The AI thought it was talking to itself really? when generating something. So sometimes you would just ask it something, I would repeat the same thing. I think you were here uh, like uh, doing some of these tests. Uh. Oh yes, I do remember seeing that in some of the play tests. I remember one of the players was in a yeah, walk in the room and it says like, you walk in the room and that was it. And it was yeah. just like, um, what happened? I noticed it getting almost worse or I see what you mean by sort of uh, reinforcing these patterns because it would happen once and it wouldn't be a big deal. And it would just be sort of be a blip or we thought it was hallucination or, or I thought it was a bug as well, but then it would happen more and more often. But that was really just uh, GPT or the GPT model teaching itself that, oh, this is acceptable. Let's keep doing it essentially. Wow. So it got stuck in kind of the wrong thing. That's so interesting. Yes. So we basically, uh, the way we feed the data, we had to change it. So we made impossible these kind of patterns to happen. And we also, so. When you talk to the DM, you only see like one agent interacting with you, but uh, there's more than that behind it, right? So we're also looking for parents that we want to exclude from its memory. So it, it doesn't reinforce themselves. I find that sort of one of the more just larger, broad pitfalls of ChatGPT and these models is that the second it gets a bad idea in its head, it's like really hard to get it out. If I include one bad sentence, one bad thing about the thing I'm trying to describe, it will sort of in the well, so to speak, uh, for the responses soon after. So there is this concept of like end shot learning, right? Sometimes when you want the AI to do a specific thing, you can give it examples. Ideally, you don't need to give it any example. That's zero shot, right? And the number of examples is the end. So like one shot, one example, two shot, two examples, like two rounds of, the, of a task. And uh, you just add more examples, the more you want to constrain or make sure that the AI has a very well-defined idea of what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to do it. So if you introduce like bad patterns, it also treats them as like a one shot, end shot. So you end up reinforcing the wrong thing. And you need to be very careful, especially if you're like into long conversations kind of thing, storytelling. You don't want to you want to make a very conscious effort to mitigate these bad examples. Yeah, it's interesting for the listener, just so you have some context on this, this technique that we're talking about shot prompting. So an example of that would be zero shot is you don't provide an example. So you just say, I don't know what color is a robin's egg one shot is you provide a single example so you might say uh what kind of restaurant should i go eat at and then on the next line you could say italian food and then after that you could say i'm hungry for lunch what kind of restaurant should i go eat at and so it'll say ah i have sort of this call and response of you know a question about where should i go eat and then a response of here's a cuisine you just asked me another question in that same vein, so let me give you another kind of cuisine. It's pretty smart at picking up patterns. Few shot or end shot, there's a bunch of different names for it, is when you provide more than one example. I actually did this with uh, sales insist that I put, and so I literally said, you know, okay, 
uh, this prompt that someone is selling, its type is job searching. This spelling, its type is uh, entertainment and you know whatever the case may be. And then I could feed it a list and say, here are 40 more prompt titles. Tell me the type for each one. And it would return that because of the training that was done with this few shot prompting. It's amazing, like the amount of effort that would have taken with you know, traditional machine learning versus here are three examples. You're fine, you'll figure it out. <laughs> I'd have to look at the exact number that I did for that analysis, but it was fives and 200 and something. And like trying to sit down and I'm going to go through 5,200 different mm -hmm. snippets. Cause these are, you know, the name of the prompt, my amazing cover letter writer, the best, uh, restaurant picker for deciding where you're going to take your spouse, you know, whatever they are, 5,000 of them. And chat GPT did it. Honestly, at the most reason it took so long, I had to build an API call for it because it was too long to do in a, like a single go in the chat. Yeah. Are there other techniques that you all have used? I think we're doing something really unique with Quest GPT. And this is where, you know, Bruno being like brilliant, he's doing this. If he wasn't doing this, he'd be building like Android bodies. I know a lot of use cases right now where you're trying to use chat GPT to interact with it in a storytelling mode and not have it almost not have it learn too much. It's very interesting. It goes against a lot of the other use cases. Uh, I'm finding a tremendous amount of use around just speeding up traditional work. For me, it's just in my regular life has been just incredibly powerful. And just even if it's, you know, getting me 80% of the way there on my tasks versus maybe it's not perfect right now. And if it's not perfect, the response, it's because my prompt's not perfect. But uh, that's personally where I've been scrolling a lot lately. There's no distinction between work, fun, and like side hobby. Awesome. <laughs> like everything I do, like for fun, I end up doing it for work, basically, and vice versa. So, for example, I'm doing these prompts where, so I have I usually rather than like work on individual prompts, I try to set up individual systems. For example, one I have is that I'm I have a YouTube addiction problem, and I end up like building playlists and playlists of specific things I want to learn. But I sometimes just don't have enough time for that. So I'm like batch downloading the playlists audio, transcribing it and giving it to like the AI so I can just read it. Instead of just putting like the video at 1.5 times speed, I can just read it. There's no redundancy. It's much more efficient. And I end up like learning so much, like many things that I end up using here. I do that for two try to be up to date with the latest yeah. prompting is also. And I do the same like for reading like papers, sometimes books, uh, but books harder because of the length. Interesting. And making sure I'm understanding you are pulling down the audio using a transcription. And then are you using GPT to do a summarization? I'm pulling the audio, I'm transcribing it. And then I'm like feeding it. Very cool. The API. Yeah. Usually I just, I have the text, so I just copy it to the web UI. I'm paying for the plus thing. And usually I just want to learn like very specific things. So I just write them there. Speaking of uh, some of these things, let's talk about the props that you gave me. You know, this is now classic uh, use of telling chat GPT, like who they are, but I've been experimenting with giving them sort of two hats at once. So I'm often wearing two, three hats. I can uh, chat GPT also be multiple people at once as well. So in this particular prompt, I'm telling them that uh, our graphic designer and they're a social media manager generating uh, images to go along with your Twitter campaign. And then I had to explain uh, what mid journey was. I think with the model I was using, it may not be so up to date, but it helped by saying mid journey is an app that can generate AI art from short prompts that describe simple images. I found it helpful this way it was thinking like a social media manager. It's going to write me tweets like a social media manager, but it's also a graphic designer. So it's thinking about how to describe images, generate images, because my goal for this prompt was for it to not only write tweets for me, but write prompts for mid journey that uh, would respond to the tweets. And it could be very basic, but uh, the tweets about communities get together, give me a tweet, you know, if the tweet's positive, give me a positive image. If the, tweet is angry, give me an angry image, whatever it is, uh, as a way to kind of things along. 
So you'll notice in the bottom part of the tweet, I'm like, write tweets based off of the following topic. I just dumped a bunch of, this is sort of a lazy dump, but I just dumped a bunch of uh, text laying around that I had written for the website and other things that were tension grabbing. It's a lot of the best all at once. And essentially just having a larger sort of topic to pull from, it gives me a larger range of responses. And so I'll often ask for 10 tweets, uh, and, uh, follow up this prompt with, hey, make 70% of them educational, 30% of them uh, humorous. And I'll also feed it my specific mid-journey prompt image, so my design language that I'm trying to figure out for branding purposes. That's so I'm right. like in love with pixel art right now and with Quest GPT, uh, Quest GPT Twitter page where kind of that tw pixel art right now. So I'm essentially, you know, I did a lot of work to sort of a prompt that would put out things that one out of four times at least gives me a very good image using mid-journey. And so essentially it'll put out a long, set of columns and then I'll copy and paste that into Google Sheets and then I'm off to the races. I could just copy and paste the one cell directly into mid-journey. It has the prompt language, everything in it. And then once again, I'll also follow up with write me five more, but make it about how AI can be ethical or good or write me five more about how it could add to your bottom line or improve ROI. So it has its main mission. It's familiar with gist. But I can pepper in, you know, steer it and get some more stylized tweets out of it. So my goal is really to just uh, stuff laying around, use a UI, you know, just go to it, type in sort of my language in my UI. Like, okay, this week's tweets will have a bent based off of building community or based off of it will AI kill us. And then I just type that in and the, my prompt will do the rest and it'll give me a good amount of tweets that I could just copy and paste and go on with my day essentially and focus on more important things, focus on that human interaction versus just writing ad copy essentially. That's awesome. Okay, so for the listeners who can't see this, let me just read this off. Pretend you are a graphic designer and a social marketing media manager generating creative images to go with your Twitter campaign tweets using an AI app called Midjourney. And then he goes on to describe Midjourney and then write Twitter tweets for the next five days based on the following topic, quote, custom AI RPG game master, similar to D&D, &D, dive into the world of custom AI RPG game masters for your Web3 community. Engage your members like never before with tailored adventures, and then some emoji and a hashtag. And then at the end is an actual mid-journey prompt, so slash imagine prompt, colon, a digital dungeon master AI sitting behind a table with a Web3 community logo, style of owl boy pixel art epic 8k resolution 3000 etc mm -hmm. etc et i don't need to keep going 8k pixel art i'm very proud of that 8K one 8k uh, pixel art interesting yeah yeah that corrects what, what me works up. works don't ask questions that's one of the things that i have been really interested in investigating is like particularly with the 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 role playing technique which sorry listeners by the way that's what that's called the pretend you are a graphic designer or a social media manager or both that's called role playing it's also called act as there's lots of different names for things but uh, by telling chat gpt to pretend they are that person or to act as that kind of person the community has found you get massively better results people are playing with you know nuances like uh, you're a graphic designer with 10 years of experience about layout and colors and whatever the case may be. And so people are trying to figure out like, what makes a difference? Why does it make a difference? How do we use this the best way? And it's so interesting to me, the tweaks that you can try to sort of get into the psychology in air quotes of chat GPT. Yeah, and I think there's also this regenerative aspect where sometimes it doesn't give me exactly what I want, but I'll try a couple of times. And then when it, where it's hitting my vibe, that's when I'll hit, say, hit me with five more tweets, hit me with five more tweets based off of this, you know, cause it figured it out at that moment. Also, let's, let's keep the party going, but yeah, a certain amount of unpredictability. And like you're saying, a small tweak, even or how it's feeling that day, it's, you don't even have to change the language. It's interesting. That actually brings up uh, one of the parameters. And I'm curious if you all are using it temperature and top P, which basically change how random and how creative in air quotes um, chat GPT is. Are those things you're using at all in quest GPT or any of your backends? Because obviously 
you know, unless you're using playground, you can't actually use change that value. Yeah, we're using all of them and even a bit more. So temperature is very important for us. So for example, we have different kind of kinds of products. One is Quest GPT, but we also have this one where we're it's basically like an FAQ bot right now. So it's used to inform people about certain things, right? So for us, temperature is like one of the knobs we can tune to say, okay, like how engaging do we want it to be? But also like how correct and predictable do we want it to be? So if we want to inform people, we want it to be like predictable, maybe not as boring. So we won't go like temperature zero, of course. Um, but for in the case of Quest GPT, we want different temperatures for different things. For example, one of the things we do is uh, we have this like character creation menu where we like dynamically generate descriptions of, of your character based on some like personality test, basically. And uh, for that, we want it to be like funny and to be like all out. So nice. we want that to be like higher temperature for that. But when we're storytelling, of course, we want it to be engaging. But if you like get it to be too hot, like it'll lose its purpose at some point. Like it'll forget what it's trying to do. So we want to not let that to be too hot. Then there's other kinds of parameters, ones that control like how repetitive it is, um, like how in track it thinks itself. Do you want it to be like to imagine new things or do you want to just specifically stay on course? We were first working on Quest GPT at ETH Denver. It's you want the you want Chat GPT to keep the dungeon master hat on. You want to have a certain amount of creativity in the storytelling. So it was a, quite a balancing act as far as, yeah, you know, a wonderful story, like let the story go a little crazy, but don't ever forget who you are, ever, you know, because it'll ruin the experience, essentially. It was pretty funny. We saw some wild things happening. I think that's one of the more fun parts of experimenting with this stuff is the temperature setting. But a lovely thing that they included in the SDK allow us to play with that. Yeah, definitely. And I'm curious, you mentioned that... Uh... Quest GPT actually, even though it appears to have one agent, it's actually multiple. Oh. Is that part of the reason you have multiple agents? So one agent can have a high temperature? So it depends on what you define as an agent. We like to think about agents as the entity that does this specific thing, but also holds this specific set of memories. So if you're giving it a different set of memories and it has a different purpose, yeah, that's a different agent. But if you're just like, it's kind of part of the same thing, then it could as well be called the same agent. But yeah, but but I feel like it could be like the same DM that's making up your description, your character flavor text. Then we want it to be a higher temperature when we are generating this completion. But for, as for the storytelling, it could as well be called the same agent, but we are like having a different set of parameters for this. Yeah, I noticed uh, during the character creation, it would be like strange quirks about the character. Like the character is also afraid of spiders. Good to know. It's like you're a strong elf, you, know, you have all this stuff, also you're afraid of spiders. And I love that. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, I really enjoyed that nuance of it. You were playing the, the sort of, you know, D&D experience. That was a lot of fun to see. Yeah, it's coming along, uh, learning a lot. It's super fun. It was a problem when we first kind of working because all we wanted to do was play with it. <laughs> yeah. And it might be worth uh, mentioning the prompt engineering around the NFT generation, Bruno, because there was a lot of temperature there as well, or cajoling as far as getting the right prompts, then getting the right art style. If you know about like AI generation models, for example, MidJourney is much better and it's much easier to talk to it. So you have to like take into account if you're leaking multiple AIs, of course, you need to change your prompt, but also change like your parameters. So we we kind of do is like, okay, we want it to be this kind of description. We want to focus on this set of things. And with Dolly, it's one thing to get like predictable responses out of chat GPT, but it's a whole nother thing to get predictable art out of an AI art generator. And for us to consistently get healthy, good, fun looking NFTs, I think was just sort of the most impressive things we did during that time, truly. By far, I have played some of these and yeah, two of the examples that I remember, one of my play tests, I was running around with, of course, with the Superman thing. I was like, okay, fine, my character has heat vision and the NFT picked up and I think it had like red lines coming out of the eyes or something like that. And then another one where somebody stabbed a dragon with a sword and 
the NFT actually showed that specific action yeah. in it. Part of what amazed me was that was not generate the NFT right after doing that. It, I think it was like 15, 20 minutes later that then the generate NFT command was run. Is that right? Yeah, we the way we set it up and I forget the exact language, but we wanted it to pull the coolest, most emotionally impactful moments. And pr that particular moment of, I said, uh, cause that was my NFT. I stabbed the dragon, like through the ear into a brain, killing it. I guess that was enough for chat GP to be like, oh yeah, probably a little too hardcore, but made a very cool NFT. I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. There's like different elements in, that go into like, uh, generating the NFT one is like, recognizing the cool events one is like building the prompt for like the nft and one is like getting the the actual image i'm curious can you tell us a bit more about how you did the find the most interesting part of the game prompt kind of part of like our secret sauce things <laughs> we have like a specific way of asking for for certain things um you know like there, there's always other techniques coming out and uh, you can see like just last week there were like uh two new like great techniques you now like one's the reflection that like you basically tell the an ai to reflect on its own performance and then there's self-critique and improvement you tell it what do you think you did wrong like how could you do it better and it improves itself its own out we're always like changing the prompts we use that's just the published ones a lot of people are working on so many things that they're not publishing and they probably have like way better like performance and what like the public stuff is showing we ourselves have like had better stuff than what's publicly known and we're uh, we're kind of there's incentive like not to share it we'll probably share it at some point but yeah like there are so many things that not so many people that know some other ways of talking to it so it's it's interesting you know everyone's learning stuff coming from like a neuroscience background can't see like a big pattern on, on what every everyone's trying to do with these techniques so like one of the main limitations of GPT models, it's not just like its attention window, but it lacks things that we as human have. So like they lack planning, they, they lack these mental voids that uh, we normally have to plan and execute things and predict things and like tweak them before we even do them. So a lot of these techniques are basically a way to compensate for that. For example, chain of thought is a way of telling it the AI okay, do this, but like go step by step. Uh, don't just like come out with the output, like figure out like how you would step by step and build up upon it. It's doing the job of like a mental voice, if you think about it, of the, of the planning and executing. And all of these are basically trying to achieve the same thing. They are working with this limitation. That's like a great approach uh, or, or a great way to, th to think about it when you're building your prompts. Think about its limitation, the things it lacks and uh, try to out, like in what way is this affecting my output and how can I compensate for that telling it to do this other thing uh, that it can self-reference from yeah and just to really call that technique out that is basically say you know do math or give me a or whatever the the thing you want is and then you say but think step by step or explain it to me step by step and for whatever reason that brings in a much higher level of fidelity in both math problems and logic problems and all kinds of different stuff. Really cool. Like, uh, that's what we're asking the AI, like come up with the, the answer right now. But sometimes like things are so complex that you need to break it, break them down. And that's what we do on our heads. But uh, all the GPT model has is, it, is its attention window. So you have to put all this, all the, the mental uh, like workflow into its attention window. Yeah, that's one of the hacks basically that I've seen for making math problems actually get calculated correctly was teach it to do multiplication by doing each decimal place individually and then add them all up. And apparently, I haven't tested it personally, but apparently that does work, but you can get just as good of output if you just say think mm -hmm. step by step or calculate step by step. Yep. What problems do you wish you could solve? with generative AI, it could be text, could be images, whatever the case may be, but you haven't figured out a way to do that yet. That's a great question. I'm still using multiple tools. Try. There's still an input. I miss Clippy. You no, know, Clippy used to live on all the Microsoft things. Like Clippy needs to come back, essentially. And it looks like you're writing a letter. Would you like me to interrupt you? 
what was it even trying to accomplish back then? But at least nowadays, on all my apps, on all my systems, on all my different things, I need this thing everywhere right now. It's driving me nuts that I have to hop around. Yeah, sometimes it's more important to think like the problems. And the, the I feel like the big question a lot of people are missing is like, I do this using AI in the first place. Now it looks like, it, it's like the saying, like when all you have is a hammer, everything looks yep. like a nail. Th that's something like we should keep in mind. Like a lot of people are trying to solve many things with AI. We don't need AI for a lot of problems. And instead we should like build interfaces with AI so it can do the things using these other tools. Yeah. So where can people follow you all and to hear about Quest GPT and all the other awesome things that you're working on? Best place to follow us is our Community One Twitter. So at Community One on the show. We also have a Quest GPT Twitter page as well. Both of those Twitter pages have links to our Discord. You can go to questgpt.io and play the game right. And also there's community1.io. I'm at Adam J. Boyle on Twitter. You can find me there. I just hide, I just lurk, so you don't need to look for me. Well, thank you both for being on the show. Thank you. It was nice being here. Thanks for coming to the Prompt Engineering Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping you be a better prompt engineer. Episodes are released every Wednesday. I also host weekly masterminds where you can collaborate with me and 50 other people live on Zoom to improve your prompts. Join us at promptengineeringmastermind.com for the schedule of the upcoming masterminds. Finally, please remember to like and subscribe. If you're listening to the audio podcast, rate us five stars. That helps us teach more people. And if you're listening to the podcast, you might want to join us on YouTube so you can actually see the prompts. You can do that by going to youtube.com slash at promptengineeringpodcast. See you next week.